Sweden, once the land of the Vikings, now arguably the most socialist and politically correct country in Europe. My first week here has been interesting to say the least. So let's talk about it. I'll be discussing my personal experiences so far with my colleague Emmy in just a second. But before we do that, let me start off on a more serious note. In my first week here, Sweden got startled by a violent knife attack. An Afghan man, aged 22, started stabbing into people in Vedlanda, a small and quiet town in the south of Sweden. The attacker wounded seven people. Three of them were injured very badly. The Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Levin, commented via Facebook that he was appalled by the horrific act of violence, following a statement that we are, and I quote, reminded of how fragile our secure existence is. Hmm. So we are reminded of how fragile our secure existence is. Could that maybe, just hypothetically of course, have anything to do with the fact that the Social Democrats have been pushing policies that have turned Sweden from a safe and functioning country into a country with no-go zones in every major city? It's just a thought. I mean, Stefan Levin might talk about this as if it's some sort of natural disaster coming out of nowhere, like being hit by lightning or something. But according to official government statistics, a third of all Swedish people feel unsafe in their own neighborhood at night. So the Swedish citizens are pretty much reminded of how fragile their secure existence is every single day. But that must all be in their heads, right? Because it's not like Sweden has reached a peak in violent knife crime, shootings and bombings over the last few years now, has it? All right, it has. According to the Swedish police force, over the last couple of years, the amount of explosions in Sweden have risen to a level not seen anywhere else in Europe. Shootings have increased by 10% in one year alone, from 2019 to 2020, and today, actually, a study came out by the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention that in concluded that the year 2020 was in fact the deadliest year Sweden has seen since they started their surveys. Why, you might ask? Well, according to the media and the police, the reasons or the underlying causes are found in criminal clashings and gang violence. So since I'm new to this country, I asked around a little bit who these criminal gangs are and what actually motivates them. But so far, nobody has been able to give me a conclusive answer. In the Swedish news reports about gang violence, it's li literally never specified who these perpetrators actually are. Turns out, surprise, surprise, it's because the Swedish poli police refrain from actually describing criminals in case it would maybe make them sound racist. Well, that explains a lot, doesn't it? Just like the fact that in response to the Vedlanda attack, police didn't want to comment on the attacker's nationality or motive. And the prime minister even took the opportunity to tell everybody, and I quote, that this had nothing to do with immigration. But the attacker was in fact an Afghan migrant with an expired residential permit. So that kind of makes it have something to do with immigration, doesn't it? Well. With me in the studio today, I have my wonderful colleague, Emmy, who I will hopefully also be talking to about some more lighthearted issues. But Emmy, yes. seriously though, I mean, if it wasn't so sad, it would almost be ironic that mm. I come here first week in Sweden, boom, yeah. major knife attack. I'm honestly a little bit ashamed to be a part of Sweden at this point, because it's like, you, here you come internationally, you're coming here to Sweden, and your first week, we're already get, getting hit by this horrific act of violence. And so I think internationally, Sweden has had such a good reputation. I mean, from countries in Europe and all around the world. And now I think that this image is going away slowly but surely, because of this surge in violence we're seeing. Right, but this is reality, right? Is right. this something that by now even still surprises you or are you so used to it yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people have become numb to it at this point. I think that we see there's, like you said, bombings, there's shootings going on, there's knife attacks and all this stuff is increasing. So none of us are really surprised anymore, which is of course a shame because again, Sweden has been seen as this country of, oh, this quiet little country, not much goes on, you know, it's peaceful here, but now it's like, right. and it's that's 
exactly the image that your prime minister wants to give off as well, right? I yeah, mean, what I mean, do you think about his comment? He says it has nothing to do with immigration. Obviously, that's absurd. I mean, like you said, this person was an Afghan citizen. He had come to Sweden just a few years ago. It has directly to do with immigration. And we see these politicians over and over again denying the issue. They're denying the fact that immigration has any to, anything to do with this stuff. And honestly, until about 2015, we weren't allowed to criticize immigration at all. Right. Because you were called a racist. You were called a hateful person for bringing up these issues. But still, we see today that they're denying the issue. They keep denying it. Right. Well, that seems like a little bit of a pan-European problem to me. I mean, right. it sounds incredibly familiar from yeah. coming from Holland. And yeah. I know for a fact that this is something that all throughout Europe people are struggling with. Yes. Yeah. But um, I have to say, though, I feel like I'm sounding incredibly negative about right? my time here in Sweden. <laughs> but I'm very happy to, in fact, be here in, at Riks and yeah. to have you Yeah, I'm so excited colleague. to have you. You're so excited. Thank you, yeah. Amy. Well, I mean, there are more things that actually have been quite negative nice about my stay here in Sweden. This might sound a little strange, but I've actually been quite enjoying literally the normal life. Because where I come from in Holland, things are looking a little different. Watch. So yeah, what you just saw is not some footage of some random police state on the other side of the world. The images that you just saw were taken two weeks ago in the Netherlands at a completely peaceful protest against draconian COVID regulations. But before I get into the specifics of that protest, let me first tell you what life has been like in Holland. My country has been in lockdown pretty much over a year now, and the last three months in particular have been incredibly strict. Basically everything is closed, from stores to restaurants, schools, bars, museums, you name it. And also, we are not even allowed to have one, more than one visitor in our own home. And, not to mention, we have a curfew, meaning that we cannot legally leave our own home between 9 p.m. and 4.30 in the morning, if you don't want to be fined, that is. And of course, the coronavirus is something that we need to take seriously. This is a serious matter. However, Despite the lockdowns that we've had, our cases in Holland are actually rising faster than they are here in Sweden, where life is pretty much as good as normal. And maybe more importantly, the side effects of my government's policies might be more detrimental than the virus could ever really be. Businesses are collapsing, entrepreneurs are losing their life livelihoods, and don't even get me started on the catastrophic effects that this rigid lockdown has had on the mental well-being of our citizens. Our economy is plummeting whilst our depression and abuse rates are going through the roof. People are starting to become desperate, but those who make a plea to our government to take into, con into consideration that life is about more than just not dying, those people are labeled immediately as virus deniers. And worse, those who make use of their most fundamental political rights, aka the right to protest, are met with the images that I've just shown you. And mind you, that protest was peaceful. Even Amnesty International stated that there was disproportionate police violence that needed to be researched. The only justification that the state so far has come up with was that there were too many people gathered at the scene. But back in April last year, at the peak of the first wave of coronavirus, there was actually a Black Lives Matter demonstration where 10,000 people gathered which was also obviously way more than what was allowed, but then it was just fine. And in the weeks following the protest, the BLM protest, the media were sure to bombard us with articles about how the risk of infection was almost zero outdoors and how nobody got infected after that particular BLM protest. Oh, and before I forget, the mayor of Amsterdam herself even walked along with the protesters wearing a political button hunter vest because she said that the protest was, and I quote, too important. But when, when 2,000 people come together to protest the government's own Dacronian measures, people are quite literally beaten to a pulp. How is that for equality? 
Because seriously, whatever your stance is on COVID or the measures, there is one thing that we should always be wary of, and that is our governments infringing on our constitutional rights. We should never regard it as normal that peaceful protesters are hit in the head with sticks, bitten by police dogs and pushed in front of police vans. That should never become the new normal. Because if history teaches us one thing, is that once you give your rights away, it's very hard to get them back. Well, that will be all for tonight. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Well, hello, everybody. That was our first episode. Thank you so much again for watching. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss out on a new one. This is all very new for us, but I hope you liked it. We'll see you next time.